Thank you for turning to page 121. Today we're going to take a look at Ion Stones, what they are, where they came from. These are some of my favorite magic items. I've given out many over the years. Uh, there are a couple of characters in our campaign that do have Ion Stones. So I'm going to explain where they came from in D&D Origins. They first appeared in the Dungeon Master's Guide. And then we're going to take a look at Encyclopedia Magicka entry for them because this covers Dragon 174 and the Ion Stones that were made up in that great article. So today on page 121, Ion Stones in AD&D. &D. Ion Stones are magic items that you can get in AD&D. &D. They're in the Dungeon Master Guide, page 147 of my edition, I believe. Yes, they are. Which is also kind of interesting because they're slightly out of order alphabetically. I'd never noticed it until this morning when I reviewed this. Incense of Obsession, Ion Stones, Instrument of the Bards. So a little uh, uh, error there in the Dungeon Master Guide, which I know is loaded with errors, but I just thought it was funny that after all these years I never really noticed it. So Ion Stones, first off where the name comes from. They, uh, the Ion Stones themselves appear in some fiction by Jack Vance, a science fiction author uh, and fantasy author that Gary Gygax liked a lot and corresponded with. Uh, in fact, Jack Vance's last name, Vance, is, uh, becomes an anagram for Vecna. And uh, he had these appear in one of his stories, so Gygax, uh, presumably with permission, took them and used them in AD&D. Also, Ione is the Norse goddess, uh, wife of Bragi. She was the keeper of the apples that kept the Norse vigorous and young. And just an interesting aside... Before I knew all that stuff, uh, when I started playing D&D &D in 1980, I lived in the, or still live in the Chicagoland area, and we had a movie host here on Channel 7, which was ABC Television, and the name of the show that she used to host was The Prize Movie with Ion, and Ion would play little snippets of music, and then callers would call in, and she'd answer on a French phone and say, no, that's the wrong guess. You know, it was basically name your tune and they give away some nominal prize. Ione spelled her name I-O-N-E. But just an interesting fact, uh, again, this was in the early 70s, and Ione used to show the old Hammer films during the summer when we were all off on uh, summer break. So that was why I watched her show, to watch the old Hammer monster movies with Christopher Lee and uh, Peter Cushing and just all the old scary movies. So just a little aside there, when we first started playing D&D in this area, we had we knew that Gygax was from the Chicagoland area. We all assumed that he just took the name from the prize movie with Ion. So we had a lot of fun with that. Uh, just picturing a mage sitting around with a French phone answering music trivia questions. But anyway, uh, look her up on YouTube, by the way. There are a few clips. The prize movie with I-O-N-E. But anyway, Ion Stones, what they are. They are useful little stones. There's 14 in the original DMG. And uh, you take these little mystic stones and you hold them up over your head and you release them. And they orbit and whirl about your head, going from one to three feet. And while they're in orbit around your head, they give you the magic listed for their uh, the color. So for uh, pale blue, which is the shape of a rhomboid, adds one point of strength to an 18 max. Scarlet blue is a sphere, adds one point to intelligence. And so on down the line for the various stats. And then we get down to the pale green, which is a prism, adds one level of experience points, or one level of experience. We always did that as one level experience only as pertains to spell effects or combat table. We never gave bonus hit points for that. Uh, we never... Uh, it was just nothing that, that we felt was appropriate. We just gave the benefit for uh, casting at one level higher. So if you're a fifth level magic user throwing a fireball, you would throw it at sixth level. And then we had the clear, which is the spindle shape. Sustains person without food or water. Very handy one to have. Iridescent, also a spindle. Sustains person without air. Pearly white spindle. Regenerates one hit point of damage per turn. Now this damage we only allowed up to zero, unlike the Ring of Regeneration, which will regen even after negative 10, uh, we only allowed this to go to zero. After zero, you are considered to be unconscious. In uh, later iterations of the Ion Stones, 
uh, if you fell asleep, they would just drift to the ground. They would not stay floating over your head. So we reasoned that if you couldn't re, if you weren't awake at zero, you couldn't regenerate with that. Uh, the next one is the pale lavender ellipsoid absorbs spells of up to fourth level, but after absorbing ten to forty spell levels, it burns out, turns to dull gray, forever useless. And then lavender and green ellipsoid absorbs spells up to eighth level. After 20 to 80 spells, burns out and becomes useless. Those are very powerful. You have to be very careful giving those out in a campaign. Then we have the Dusty Rose, which is, I'm sorry, the Vibrant Purple, which is a prism, and it stores 2 to 12 levels of spells. Now, this is a little ambiguous. When it says stores, does that mean that if someone throws a fireball, or it's a bad choice, a magic missile at me, it absorbs the magic missile for one level? Can I cast with that? Can do they just stay stored? What do they do? We rule that you can store them like a ring of spell storing. You can cast a spell onto them, and then when you want, you can cast the spell out of the island stone. Then we have Dusty Rose, which is also a prism. It gives plus one protection. And then the Dull Gray, which are any shape, they are burnt out dead stones. These are good to add uh, psionic strength. Uh, 10 points of psionic strength for a total of 50 max. However, we don't use psionics in our campaign, so what we ruled was the dull gray ones, once they burnt out, if you have a mage who is a high enough level, he could go ahead and he can enchant those to become any one of these. Now, in our campaign, we don't allow island stones. We do allow them to be cast, or, sorry, we do allow them to be created, but I'm very careful in how I allow them to be created. You have to get the right type of stone. It has to be cut in the proper shape. And then you have to enchant an item and all that other fun stuff that causes a magic item to be created. We do allow them to be found. That's the primary way to get them in our campaign. But like I say, you can't create them. I, I make it difficult. Island stones bring a lot to the table. I really don't want somebody with multiple stones floating over their heads adding to a lot of their stats. Then we go to the stones that are in Encyclopedia Magica. This came... From an excellent dragon article, number 174, which gave us a bunch of new stones. And this was pretty welcome. Uh, at this time, you know, we've been playing D&D more than 10 years, almost 15. And uh, it was nice to have some more uh, island stones be available. We, of course, had made up a few magic island stones over the years. Nothing I can recall off the top of my head. I know I made up, I think I made up one that parried a sword thrust, if you were surprised. Or any kind of blow if you were surprised. The stone would zip down and take the blow. Uh, it's the only one I remember off the top of my head having actually created on my own. So then we have a whole bunch of them here. And I'm not going to go through each and every one. But I just want to point out that they, these are really nice. And the reason I went to this book rather than Dragon 174. Is because the old dragons can be kind of hard to find. But this book's available on Drive -Thru RPG for... I think five or ten dollars for the PDF. So I knew that everybody would be able to find this if they didn't already have it They'd be able to find it there. So that's why I use this as my reference rather than the original dragon article so just a couple of ones that they uh, Give out there are a few cursed ones uh, Bestows airy water in a ten-foot sphere at will the cursed version uh, Functions normally one die four times and then fails for one die four plus five rounds after activation the next time it's used. So you can be pretty deep underwater when this thing just decides to cut out. I don't go much for cursed items. I do use some. Cursed items can be a lot of fun, but they can also kind of overtake a, uh, even a game. But they'll certainly overtake a character if they're not handled cor correctly. So I'm pretty spare with my cursed items. So then we come down to... Uh, you can go ethereal with a bl bright silver cylinder for one hour's duration... Supercharged version, which he, he has in the article, allows ethereal travel for two hours. Two die ten charge, charges in the stone, and then it becomes useless. So these were pretty neat. Uh, this one, uh, uh, the incandescent blue sphere, adds one level to spell ability until removed. So that's similar to the adds one level that we already had from the original. Uh, this... The deep black sphere, for instance, the island stone allows users to see in magical darkness. The cursed stone blinds the character until remove darkness or remove curses cast. As I said, I am spare with my cursed items. They can be a lot of fun, but they're more of a chuckle for the DM, and certainly not a fun for the uh, player characters. 
So now we're going to go to the next page, which has the Maroon Star. Uh, the use of this Island Stone can be harmed only by magical weapons and spells. But then you take full damage. The curse version makes the character take full damage from all weapons until remove curse is cast. So this is pretty powerful, especially if you're fighting humans. Uh, remember, monsters of so many hit dice uh, act as if they were striking with magical weapons. So from four up, it's a plus one. Eight up, it's a plus two equivalent. So it's not really good against monsters. But if you're in a uh, city campaign where there might be a lot of city guards, this is pretty powerful because most city guard are not going to have magical items. Uh, here we go to the orange cube. This island stones grants resistance to mind affecting as if the user had a wisdom of 20. Another couple to look at would be the pink and green ellipsoid. This from Strategic Review. The Island Stone absorbs up the, the fourth level, spells up the fourth level. Uh, one thing I like about these encyclopedias is they're very complete. So here we have Strategic Review Magazine, uh, which actually does predate the DMG now that I'm seeing it. So that would have been the first appearance of Island Stones in D&D. And then we have a neat little picture of a guy with island stones floating around his head. And it's just, they're a neat item. We had a uh, player years ago, and she did not like the idea of the stones whirling and darting about her head all, all the time. She said it made her character feel dizzy and uncomfortable. And she didn't like the fact that the minute they walked into any public place, people saw the magical stones whirling about her head and knew right away that she had magical items. So I thought about that, and I thought, well, D&D is about fun, so let's sit, think of a way to, to take care of that. So what I did is I developed a headband that the Island Stones could be placed in. And uh, I did the same for another player uh, in a different campaign, but who was in the original campaign with a woman that didn't like the Island Stones. She liked the power. She didn't like them whirling around her head. Uh, and I gave a helmet that did the same. But I made it clear in both cases that the headband and the helmet are ancient, unknown magics that are very hard to duplicate and impossible at our current levels, etc., etc. In other words, I didn't want them rampant in my campaign. I made it clear that these were just a couple of uh, non-such magic items that I was going to allow just because there was a specific issue with the magic items with the player, uh, and I wanted to keep game enjoyment up. That doesn't mean I roll over every single time a player wants something, but if it's something that's bothering, bothering a player to the point that they actually say they're their character finds it distracting, I'll try to do something about it just to keep the, keep the enjoyment of the character going. So that's really all I have to say about Island Stones today. Uh, I hope you like these magic items. I do. I like them a great deal. I have two characters that have some magic island, some Island Stones, and I find them very useful. I like giving them out, but as I said, I'm pretty spare with them. They can be pretty powerful. Uh, you don't want to give a bunch of these out. So that's it for today on page 121. Please like and subscribe if you liked what you heard and saw. Please tell your friends. Also remember there is a Patreon going right now to try to help the channel. Uh, keep me able to do these as often as I've been doing them. Uh, and maybe improve the quality of my equipment and my backdrop, things like that. So thanks for watching and I'll see you next time on page 121.